Welcome to a special two-part series of Kalamazoo Lively Arts exploring the idea of creativity. What is it? Why is it important? And where does it start? Support for Kalamazoo Lively Arts is provided by the Irving S. Gilmore Foundation, helping to build and enrich the cultural life of greater Kalamazoo. If you look at little kids, they're always putting ideas together and saying, gee, what if something, you know? Basically, creativity comes from putting things together that haven't been put together before. It's imagination. When you really open up your creative sense, it it takes that wonder, it opens out that imaginative part of yourself. Finding ways to try something new, to, to find a new way of approaching a problem, that's creativity to me. Generativity in general, like yeah. trying to come up with something new, there's a lot of question about what creativity is in general anyway. Creativity, imagination, these concepts seem so obvious as children, but what are they really? We interviewed a number of people and dove into our vault to understand the nuances of creativity and how it's woven into the ways people live, work, and play in Kalamazoo and beyond. We start by talking with Professor of Physiology at Michigan State University, Robert Root Bernstein, co-author of Sparks of Genius, a book about cultivating creativity. Tell me a little bit about physiology, first of all, and how you decided to kind of pursue that. Well, physiology is the study of body systems and how they're all integrated so that we actually can live. <laughs> I actually did not decide to become a physiologist. Ended up doing a postdoc with Jonas Salk, the guy who invented the first polio vaccine, and that got me hooked on doing research. You know, when it comes to creativity, people may think of the arts. Uh, yeah, a lot of people do have this misconception that creativity is art and art is creativity. So your book Sparks of Genius, what's the takeaway? The takeaway is that we can all be creative. There are basic ways of thinking about things which we use for all problem solving and problem solving is just, you know, the key step in creativity. So whether you believe in creativity and that's what you want to do or not, you just want to be a good problem solver. Yeah, I imagine like you have to be excited when you're doing something that hasn't been done before because it's got to get you through all the naysayers. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the things my wife and I have done is looked at almost all the Nobel Prize winners and it's very common in their stories that for the first 20 years, everybody said, you're crazy, why are you doing this? Um, you know, you're wasting your time. And you think about spending 20 years with all your colleagues saying, no, 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 yeah. no, no. You really, you really have to have confidence in yourself. Yeah, right. So that's another key to being creative. Um, you know, helping kids to figure out what they're good at Con being confident in their skills. And that doesn't mean being the best. I think that's another mistake we make. You know, everybody has to be the best or whatever. The people who succeed are often not the best when they're young. Um, they just like what they're doing and they keep doing it. If you haven't failed in life, you haven't lived. Because failure tells us that we've taken a risk. That we're still challenging our own limitations. It's only when you cross the boundary of your comfort zone that you begin to open the lid of who you are. And rid yourself of the box that everyone tells you to think outside of. And history, history favors the risk takers. Because only those who risk going too far can find out how far we can actually go. You'll never read about anyone throughout history who successfully inspired change. Because they followed the crowd. Because they played it safe. Because they cared too much about what other people thought about. Remember that your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. It's only when you jump blindly from your nest that you can experience the act of flying. You just have to be willing to spread your wings and trust your mental sort of heights you never thought possible from the comfort of your fear. Don't allow the things that scare you to keep you grounded. Instead, become like the Wright brothers after their first crash and be willing to collide into the dirt to turn the toughest moments of your life into the burst of wind you need to get you airborne so that one day you can see what the 
the bottom looks like from the clouds. And know that just because your eyes can't see past the horizon, it doesn't, doesn't mean, mean that, that the, the world, world ends at the sunset. As we talked to more people, we encountered a recurring theme. The way we learn and the skills we develop young help us later in life. So how does creativity tie into the workplace? How does imagination lead to innovation in industry? We talked to Troy Thrash, president and CEO of the Air Zoo, to get some insight. What's really interesting about creativity and imagination, very different from like water or electricity or, or most other things, you know, the more you use those, the less there is of something, right? The more I eat M&Ms out of a bag, the less there is, and it's so frustrating. But the more you exercise imagination and creativity, the bigger your bucket gets, and it continues to fill. What's the most fun part? What's the best part of your job that you enjoy? Well, it, it's funny, it really comes down to creativity. So in administration, you would think there's not that much creativity, but sitting in my little seat in the education department and working arm in arm with Education for the Arts, I'm able to give wonderful things to people. So cooking up the next cool thing we're going <laughs> to do, um, it's Really, the, the ideas get really big. Um, I, I'm an idea factory. An administrative team uses creativity in all kinds of ways. So for a creative arts organization, it has every layer of ideas and flavors and colors that come together with the way that people think about problems and ideas to create solutions, not just for things like human resources or the way that your finances are presented or the marketing that you're doing. It's in all of those layers as well well as the musical and artistic layers that we create. The creative process is about problem solving. This I think is really valuable for children to learn because it helps them figure out how to fix things later in life. Um, there are many different ways to go about solving problems. And here we are in your beautiful air zoo. Did all this love for the air zoo start when you were, eh, maybe about seven years old? When I was seven years old, growing up in eastern Pennsylvania, I was finally brave enough to go out in the dark sky with my trusty golden retriever, Biscuit. And we took this little guy, my parents bought me, this is my first telescope that my parents bought me when I was seven. Uh, I had been reading books about astronomy and seeing really cool pictures of stars and nebulae and galaxies and they wanted to take my learning even further by buying me this telescope. And I so vividly remember the first time that I turned this telescope to the moon and saw that it wasn't this two-dimensional disk of gray and white that I was seeing in photos and seeing up in the night, the night sky, but it was really a three-dimensional sphere of mountains and valleys and craters. And the most important thing it did for me was not answer questions that I had, but for every question that I got answered, it gave me a hundred new ones that I wanted to seek answers for. And you took all of those hints, those hints of creativity, of imagination, to bring you to where you are now. After a, a degree in astronomy and astrophysics from Villanova University, I went to go work for NASA on the Hubble Space Telescope and at the Space Telescope Science Institute down in Baltimore. And it was a remarkable experience in so many ways. I had the opportunity to work with astronomers from all over the world who were scheduling observations on this, what I think is the most remarkable feat of engineering, this telescope that is going around the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour and taking the highest resolution, deepest images of our universe that we have ever seen. And so to be able to work with astronomers and, and it was my job to kind of put the puzzle pieces together to build week-long calendars that said, we're going to be observing this object here. And then at that point, it's gonna go either behind the earth or something too close to the sun. And so then we're gonna look at this object over here. And, and it was this most remarkable puzzle. And the cool thing about it was, there was never one answer. And so it really helped me understand that when you've got these big problems to solve every week, that there are so many different directions you can go. And I credit all of that, again, to 
this thing inspiring me to ask questions, to use my imagination, and to be creative. And so it became my life's mission to inspire other people about the importance of pushing the envelope in math and science and technology. So creativity and innovation is alive and well in the sciences. Creativity and innovation, without them, I don't think we can possibly push the envelope of science. As we look around and think about, I, even starting from the Wright brothers, okay, which was just over a hundred years ago, by the way, we were having this airplane down in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, fly less than a hundred feet, in fact. Less than a hundred years later, we're going to the moon. None of that happens without being creative, imaginative in what that solution might look like and ultimately building that innovation. When I met him, I didn't like him. <laughs> you think I'm joking? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at him. You he can't can say that now. I look better than you. He can you, pull so. up the, t the tennis shoes and the, and, the, and the sport coat. I'm not kidding. I didn't like him. You know why? Because we came from opposite sides of the world, so it seemed. Opposite sides of the track, so it seemed. And not only that, but we were competing against each other. Oh. <laughs> Someone says, oh. <laughs> okay. So, um, and when you're competing against someone else, how many first places are there? Mine, correct. That's how it works. That's how we function. When I met him, I was in that mentality and it took a little bit of time for me to understand and know that he, he would be the person who would change my life. Oh, someone goes, oh, oh shut up. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not kidding with you because I was at the age of 26 I was still having nightmares because I ha had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I have all kinds of issues. I mean, my medical portfolio is about as thick as, I mean, you can imagine. Um, some of you are like, I could see emotional problems in there. <laughs> and, I mean, you've even had a chance to see it. And at 26, I had never told anyone what happened to me when I was a child. I was afraid that if I shared this with you, you wouldn't love me. I mean, why would you? But see, Gabriel at the time when I met him had the courage to share his scars, both figuratively and literally. And when he shared it, other people were like moved. Art brings us together. Yeah. That's, that's what it does. Art is one of those things, um, whether it's a performing art or whatever, that brings people together. It's a common thread. A common conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it creates a place where, where people can understand and empathize. In your book, you studied like some of the great minds, Albert Einstein, Jane Goodall. Tell me about, about what you learned. What we focused on were a set of what we think of as mental tools, or a you know, mental toolbox of ways that people think as they're setting up their problem and trying to go through it. And some of them turned out to be things that people in the arts do a lot, but we found people in sciences who were successful doing as well, empathizing. We didn't really think about it, so we started studying. We started finding scientists who were talking about empathizing with a neutron star. Like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, and they would play act. They'd literally become the neutron oh, wow. star to try and understand what it wanted to do and how it would work. Jonas Salk, who I worked with, said that's how he solved the, the polio problem. If I was a virus, what would I want to do in the body? Why do I want to go to you know, a nerve? Um, what am I going to do in the nerve? And so once I get inside that virus's brain, if you want, what can I now do as a human being to interfere with what it wants to do? In describing the creative toolkit used for problem solving, Dr. Bernstein says that the arts are the best sources of these tools, and that brings us to the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts, where Executive Director Belinda Tate discusses the ways in which art, empathy, and community intertwine. 
So when did your love of art begin? When I was a student at Yale, I was doing some research in the Beinecke Library and I ran across two works of art and those two works just spoke to me uh, in a way that I hadn't experienced before and in that moment I really understood that art is transformative. You brought in an exhibit recently, Black Refractions. What did it do for a community and what was your intention for it to do to the community? Wow. <laughs> it will take a long time to unpack that, but I will say the three shows that we hosted simultaneously exceeded all of our expectations. I really hoped that it would teach people that there's a lot more that we need to know about ourselves and the world and would inspire us to get busy. Some later research from an outside source suggested that it was perhaps the largest installation of African-American art ever. Our attendance more than double what our normal attendance would be. But was also what was really impressive is comments about how the show changed them. One person talked about the show inspiring them to learn more about the history and culture of all people. One person wrote that it was so important to have kids here in Kalamazoo exposed to the diversity that's out there in the big world and to be able to explore so many different ideas and perspectives through this exhibition that they wouldn't have the opportunity otherwise to be exposed to. Belinda talks about how art can create empathy and build bridges in community. But art does more than that. It gives people perspective and skills that can go far beyond the gallery wall. Robert Root Bernstein says that after interviewing and studying creative geniuses, a set of common traits or mental tools, including empathy, emerged. It was interesting because almost all of these tools are out there, people know about them. Many of them are actually in our curricula. If you go to the school curricula, they say you should do the following things. So they're things like observing. You know, every science class is supposed to teach observing. Um, uh, abstracting, what's the key element um, out of all the things that you're observing that are important. Imaging, you know, being able to then recreate that in your head so that you can see it again, uh, or hear it again, or feel it again. You know, you need to be able to remember things and work with them. Uh, but then there are you know, things like modeling. Uh, we tend to give kids in classes a model. It can be a model essay, which they're supposed to copy. It can be uh, you know, a model of how something works in science, whatever it happens to be. We almost never have them build their own models. At the KIA, we try to position ourselves as a primary learning partner for parents. And a lot of parents feel intimidated about bringing their kids into the museum. Maybe they don't know a whole lot about art. Maybe they are, it feel uncomfortable if a child asks them a question and then they don't know how to answer it. So we try to support both the parent and the child in a learning experience. We teach parents to simply ask questions. Yeah. What do you see in this piece? What makes you think this way? What else do you see in this piece? Use those prompts to um, add in vocabulary to teach kids about critical thinking and problem solving and uh, compare and contrast relationships, etc. This is a very well developed technique called VTS, Visual Thinking Strategies. It was developed by Philip Yenawine and it's used among museum professionals nationally, even internationally, but we try to teach this technique to parents so they can have better learning experiences with their, their children yeah. in the galleries. The other part of this is that most children are visual learners and they don't have the opportunity to really talk about what they see. And certainly when you get into the examination of an image, it teaches kids to think on different levels, yeah. on deeper levels and in broader terms. How does creativity help Kalamazoo? Seventy-five percent of kindergartners today will have jobs in the future that 
do not exist today. When I think about the, the type of young people that Stryker and all of these other technical companies, manufacturing companies, IT companies, biomedical companies, just across the board, when I think about the kinds of young people that they want to nurture and grow right here in Kalamazoo, they're looking for young people that will ask, how can it be better for our community? And then use that creativity and imagination to ultimately create an innovation. Creativity, imagination, and the arts are all important for employers, but how do they benefit a city? A lot of times, artists don't talk about the economic benefits of having artists in your community, but I've seen the downtown grow, and it's grown in part due to the arts being such a, a lively um, experience in, in living in Kalamazoo. How does Kalamazoo, this whole imagination mm -hmm. uh, commentary, how does it benefit from? Well, sure. Well, there's definitely an economic benefit to um, the arts, in, not only Kalamazoo, but in the, in the state. And uh, the last numbers that I've seen that came out was that $1.3 billion were invested in um, Michigan through leisure activities. And I call it leisure activities because that involves all sorts of arts and culture, whether you're going to the zoo or going to a museum or seeing a ballet, it's all wrapped up in there. And definitely that trickles down to Kalamazoo. For a size that it is, I mean, our the city of Kalamazoo is only 74,000 people, and but we have our own symphony. Having, having a symphony in your own backyard, how does sure. that help your citizen? So the economic answer is that if you're a striker, if you're Pfizer, if you're a larger corporation that's looking for some place that's affordable to live and has wonderful hiking in, in uh, you know, Lake Michigan for your employees. And, and your an arts council, And too. has an arts council, exactly. If you're looking for some place for your employees and you want to build a new plant here, that's definitely a draw, that there's also these rich cultural activities for your employees. This is the Kirk Newman Art School, right? Mm -hmm. And you teach classes here, those will be starting shortly. What kind of people take your classes? When people get hired into Kalamazoo, especially the uh, technology and the medicine fields, they'll come up, a lot of them from Europe. They come down here because they want to have something outside of their work and they start meeting people. And so there's just, I had a, a retired engineer from Los Alamos. Can you believe it? Yeah. I had prosecutors, I had dr 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 drug scientists, you know, from Pfizer here. It kind of blows my mind, you know. I'm like maybe the least educated person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Creativity. Employers want it, economies benefit from it, but do employees have it? The answer is not as black and white as it may seem. Dan Seitzma of Improv Effects uses applied improvisation to strengthen teams, culture and leadership in workplace settings. He discusses where he sees gaps. I've studied a lot of how the brain responds throughout life and how creativity and curiosity is something that a lot of times ends up sort of atrophying over time. And industry, workplaces are desperate and want people to be more creative. They want them to create uh, solutions to problems and innovate new solutions to general problems to create new products or services or uh, technologies. And it's hard sometimes to get people to get into that creative mode and to feel comfortable and confident getting into that creativity. If you create the safety that we create in an improv setting, you know, in a rehearsal or on stage, if you create that safe environment, all of a sudden folks are sharing creative ideas, surprising themselves, and the ideas are just pouring out. We say, why is this so unusual? In part two of this series, we'll explore that very question and more. We found that creativity and imagination are essential for innovation problem solving and building careers. Beyond that, however, these concepts are important for human reasons. My 
favorite, my favorite moment and experience was 2015, um, the annual celebration of success through Speak It Forward. I performed a poem that highlighted like struggles I had with my mother and it was a really hard journey and a really hard process to get there but once I performed that poem and I did so with like the most grace like I've never been more graceful um, when I left the stage I felt all of that weight still there I felt like I could walk away from all of the pain that that had caused me and there was a woman who came up to me after the show and she just thanked me for highlighting that story because she had a similar experience and she had never heard the story told in such a beautiful manner. And so just, you know, finding those points of connection and knowing that I really did impact another person's life, it made me feel like this was what I was set here to do. Success and failure, they hold hands. You just have to be willing to jump off the deep end. Because pearls don't lie on the seashore. If you want one, you have to dive to the bottom and take it. It's only when you dig deep that you can plant the seeds that will grow into something beautiful. And we'll guarantee that when you wake up in the morning, you still feel alive. It doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter where you end. What, what matters, matters most is what you do in between. The steps you took you to get to wherever you are. And the times you got back up after you fell. So dust yourself off. Start chasing your dreams. And start living a life that will leave you with a smile on your face. And a strong heartbeat in your chest. And start that life today. Start by taking a risk. Start by learning from your failures. And start to appreciate the scars you have that remind you that you lived a life worth living. Thank you. How do the arts foster creativity? Why are they important? And what does the art scene look like in Kalamazoo? Creativity comes in many shapes and forms and is very important to problem solving, innovation, and in the workplace. We also have heard experts talk about the relationship between creativity and the arts. Now we'll explore that relationship, see its role in our shared humanity, and take a look inside Kalamazoo to see what a community rooted in the arts can create. One student said to me one time, and she said, thank you for saving my life. And I thought, saving your life? How did I save your life? I still get emotional. And she said, you brought me art. I feel like it's vital. I don't know where I would be without art and pretty much all of the artists that I know, I don't know where they would be. I can come to the studio or go to the theater tired, and dragging, and the minute I get involved in the teaching and directing, I just get all energized. I go home and I can't go to sleep. It enabled me to realize that I have a story and I have a history to my life that is, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's traumatic, but at the same time, it's kind of transformed me into who I am now. It is vulnerable. <laughs> it's, it's extremely vulnerable. Um, I enjoy it though. I think it's um, important for other people to see that type of vulnerability, I think that the way our world is set up, is it's meant to stifle that. You're not supposed to be open. You're not supposed to be honest. You're not supposed to talk about what's bothering you or what trauma you've been through. Those things, the trauma, the oppression, all those things are meant to silence you. And so for me, it's, it's freedom for me to get up on a stage and look out into the audience and make eye contact with people and know that what I have to say may change someone's life. It makes me feel so free. <sighs> so I'm a little very nervous right now, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I brought my piece out, but I know that I can do this. So if I lose my words, please just be with me. Um, leading up to this event, I was posed with a question, which was, if the world was to end on May 2nd, what do you need to get out? What are the things that you need to heal? And, um, I spent a couple weeks running from the truth. I was trying to hide, I was trying to come up with another piece, and I had a couple people that acted as mirrors and just um, showed me exactly what I was putting out, which is, I need to heal. And um, this next piece is just that. Um, it's a really difficult piece for me to get through, but I need to heal. The arts are an outlet for expression and a conduit to empathy and understanding. Artists all over Kalamazoo find ways to use art for good. I see it all the time. I see so many different things, though. 
Um, I see the art school as a healing place. Maybe they're experiencing some type of life transition and they need to reconnect with themselves. And they get into the school space and they start making something. And that physical process of doing something different opens them up to new ideas and it becomes part of a healing experience. I've seen that time and time again. So April, tell me a little bit your story, how you arrived here at the Kirk Newman It's Art not the school. conventional story. Yeah. Uh, I'm not coming out of school. I've been around for a while. Um, I had a cancer diagnosis 13 years ago and things change. You had to find different things. Um, I actually had the moment where, when am I gonna leave my kids? And mm. I didn't have any jewelry. And I became obsessed with jewelry and gemstones and started making my own pieces, setting stones. Um, and I wasn't happy with commercial pieces you could buy. Right. And I found this place and got hooked. And so what did the art do do for you and, and to you when you, you went through that, that, that cancer diagnosis? It gives me an outlet. It, uh, my exhibit especially was a way for me to think about uh, the feelings I had, the choices I had. Um, not me, but like other women that were in my um, same circumstance and just kind of put it into metal. And I also, I love to try something new and, and this is always yeah. something new. You're trying something, is it gonna work? Is it not gonna work? Yeah. yeah. Is there significance to the two faces on this? So that's me and my child and that's us going through uh, the chemo. And then the pieces up, upstairs are all about the choices and life and death and the outcomes. And art, art is for everyone. It's kind of the slogan here, right? I mean, and how important is it to expose kids to art? That's what's nice about, and, and at any age, that's what's great about the school is anybody can be here. You don't have to be in a master's program or you know at a university program. You can be here and do it at a really high level for as long as you want. I have a problem. Okay, well, if I'm being honest, I have several problems, maybe even lots of problems. But I have one that seems to be reoccurring ever since I was little. I'm constantly trying to fix things that are broken. As a child, I would take apart my walkie-talkie just to figure out why it stopped working, only to realize all it needed was a new set of batteries. And now, as an adult, I'm constantly trying to fix the people in my life, constantly trying to help them turn their past hardships into triumphs so they can finally let go. I even go as far as to do this with myself. I wake up every day grateful to be alive, but it's quickly followed by the feeling of fear, an impulse to check my phone for any missed calls informing me that a loved one has passed, informing me that you have passed. And even though I know that one day it's inevitable, I find myself grateful each day it hasn't happened that's when I think of you. I think of how proud you are of all the work I do, of all the time I spend getting people to break down their own walls, knowing that I haven't found the strength to open the closet doors wide enough to let my own demons fall out. But I've been holding these skeletons back for about 10 years now, and I'm beginning to choke on these words like bones I've kept buried on the back shelf of my throat. So I'm sorry. Education, as we know it traditionally, is on life support, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Kids go to these systems and um, they're plugged into places that don't really validate how they learn. It doesn't even give them a chance to express um, in a generic way all the alternative things that they want to explore. And unfortunately, there's a whole lot of disparity there too. One of the things when working in the school system, we know, is there is a great amount of emphasis placed on testing. There's a large emphasis on classroom time, attendance, any number of things that haven't changed since any of us have been in school. What did start to change was support for the arts and particular classes and support for the school and a lot of times arts programs were the first to go. I don't think we could devastate a school anymore than deciding to take away its arts programs. 
This is where students can find themselves. So many students who, like myself, felt a little lost at times, but found refuge in choir and in band, found refuge in being in a stage play. I'm sorry that I struggled to separate my mother from the addict, but I don't know the difference between the two. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's hard for me to see beyond the scars on your face, the ones that were caused by your nervous tics, caused by your need to scratch and pick, caused by nights you spent sleepless in search of dreams that gave me nightmares. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's hard for me to hug you, but each time I embrace you, I feel the burn on my knees from all the nights I knelt, praying to a God I'm still not sure is real, but but still being thankful each morning you came home. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm still struggling to separate my mother from the addict. So some days I want to yell and scream at you, but some days I just want to hold you and reassure you that waking up this morning was worth it. But most days, well most days I just wish I had a mother. And I wonder why it's been left to me to be the parent that you could never be. And I'm sorry. Sometimes it's tricky as a teacher to balance the social versus the education driven yeah. part. And I definitely try to balance that it's both. Dee Dee Alder is a teacher with Orchestra Roa, a free year round music program serving newly resettled Syrian children and other refugee families in Kalamazoo. Roa means both hope and spirit in Arabic. The reason that this orchestra exists is to give them a skill and an art form, but it's also for them to socialize and be able to hang out with people, you know, in a safe space yeah. that support them. So um, I, I definitely balance the two. You know, I was talking to one of the girls about her leaving Syria just the other day and what that experience was like. Mm. And I've also talked to some of the students about what their experience at school is like and if they're dealing with any discrimination or bullying, bullying and yeah. that kind of stuff. And some of them are. And so I'm using the drum as a way, I like to incorporate that into a way to empower them. Like yeah. we create rhythms and right. just like drum and get right. it out. Right. And then we also balance with this sort of academic of techniques and playing, reading music and, you know, playing Arabic rhythms. It's a very treasurable experience to just like have somebody and they'll be like, mm. Mm, a little shy, a little something, and they'll just kind of do that thing where they like close their journal a lot. And then like three months later, they're <laughs> like, hey, I wrote another poem. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're just like ready for it. Or they're like performing their poetry in front of a, a hundred or 200 people. And they're just open. And there's one thing to see the artistic growth, and it's another thing to see the human growth. They're working on caring for you and with each other. They're working on finding their voice and being able to name their emotions. They're working on advocating for themselves so that they can actually speak to their teachers and their parents and each other and, and teach them how to treat them. Yeah. Those are baseline things that we take for granted that aren't being done. Don't cut, don't cut anything in the arts, people, right, right. because, um, you know, people learn to soar. When, when art is in your environment, people learn to soar. They had a bunch of pilots that flew the SR-71 Blackbird at the Air Zoo uh, a while back, and my dad went down there, and my dad, as I said, mm -hmm. no interest in the arts, asked what should, you know, what would prep kids to do what you did and he said, learn a musical instrument. Like, this is a guy who was one of the elites in aeronautics or in flight. And he's saying, go learn the violin if you want to fly this thing. 
and that is just mind blowing. Are they able to measure if music transfers into good work in the classroom? Do we know? Well, now that is the problem that everybody would like to solve. Um, what I can tell you is that the kids in tune students attend school much more regularly than children in the same building who aren't at Kids in Tune. They miss something like five fewer school days a year. Now, and that is one thing that every education professional will point to. Better attendance leads to better outcomes. So I'm actually in a very unique position because I've studied both music and science. And many people often They'll ask me or they'll say, oh, you know, mathematics and music or science and music is actually very related, so you must be, you must be good. And it's true to a large extent. It's not always true, but there are some very, very fundamental similarities that I think really help students who, who, have, who have an exposure to music, uh, help them to become better at the maths and the sciences. I felt from a, from a young age learning music and learning to read music and, and discovering the notes and the values, uh, which is just fractions. I mean, it's, this, it's the same thing they teach in the schools. By the time I got to third or fourth grade where we were learning that stuff, I knew it because it was, for me, it was actually, it was a very deep and real understanding from playing it and from experiencing it instead of, instead of just learning something by rote. So I think that by learning music, uh, children have given themselves a real head start in the hard sciences. And so they say a lot of the time uh, STEM uh, programs should actually be STEAM programs, adding the arts. And I, I fully agree. When I was in school, there were multiple classes um, music. It was always available. With that being cut, in so many schools and programs. Yeah. How do you think that really can affect society, the kids? I'm not an alarmist. You know, yeah. I try not to go over the top, but it's, it's a problem. I mean, it's really one of the few places where people, human beings, kids learn how to relate to others. That's actually one of the, th one of the things that people argue for music education, is that music helps us understand our own emotions and understand the feeling states of other people. In the study that we, we did actually, we took a, a small number of children and we built an underlying accompaniment and then had them improvise on just the black keys on the piano so that there were no wrong notes. An area that became activated that we weren't really looking for but we found um, was a parts of the brain involved with empathy. I'm sorry that it has to come out like this but I don't know how to talk to you anymore, or maybe I never really did. Maybe that's why it's so uncomfortable for, you, uncomfortable for you to break down in front of me when you tell me how much you hate your life. And it kills me, because I know that taking you apart and putting you back together again can't help you, that putting new batteries in you won't fix you, that there's nothing I can do to save you. Mom, I'm sorry. I'm not saying this to hurt you. Believe me, I don't want to add to the lists of reasons why you wish you hadn't woken up this morning. I just need you to hear me. Black refractions, right? It's a lot of people's personal stories. Why is that important? There are many different stories in our society that have been hidden or suppressed. The exhibitions that we've done recently have played a role in giving us a safe space to process that information and to open us up a little bit so that we can make some necessary changes. If we look at the history of change in our country, there has been no major social, political, or economic or movement of any type that hasn't involved the use of art. I've tried ignoring your addiction for too long now. I've tried pretending it doesn't exist, but I've spent 10 years now picking up the pieces you've left behind, and there's no more room for any more secrets on the back shelf of my throat. These skeletons want to come out and receive a proper burial, like this one. 
This one that you dropped during a seizure after you'd been gone for four days and four nights with no sleep. Or the one when, at 17 years old, I knew paramedics by first name because I saw them more than my own father. We like to think that artists are the ones that can reimagine a better world. Mm -hmm. So as an artist, what better world would you reimagine? We are here to tell stories that have been untold. Um, we are here to represent people who haven't been represented, uh, at least not equally. We all have different flavors. We all have different shades and different tones. And, and, I, and I, I want that tapestry, like I want to continually build and, and have new colors and new flavors and new stories and, and that's kind of what I want to see happen. What's your vision? What would you like to see happen <laughs> musically? I would like everybody to be able to enjoy and play an instrument or <laughs> sing or do whatever they would like to do, but I want, I want that open access yeah. for everyone. I would love for all people to not have to struggle in order to live a you know, a happy, meaningful life. You know, I would love to at least contribute to that revolution or that movement um, with my music. I want us all to be able to have the things that we need and have those things be adequate for you to be able to be happy, to be unpersecuted, to be unpressured by so many of the things that society has, and for us to be able to really enjoy the pursuits of happiness as we want them. So juicy, the way that you're waste every night, your prayer, that's why I call you my girl. You're more complete than centuries and analogies. Why support the arts in Kalamazoo? Why support the arts? The arts ask us to step away from our lives uh, as sort of what we have to do every day and make us think about our life as um, what it can be. So Ed, what would happen without the arts in Kalamazoo? <laughs> well, it would be a vastly different place, wouldn't it? The arts define us and they allow us to, to realize what, what, what we are, in fact. Um, if you share an artistic experience with somebody, uh, it leads to questions, it leads to ideas, it leads to conversations, it, it leads you down a path that is very difficult to get to otherwise. If we didn't have literature, if we didn't have music or visual art, uh, we wouldn't be the same society. We wouldn't be the same culture. You know, people say the word artsy fartsy. I went, oh. Like it's a bad thing. Like it's a bad <laughs> thing. Like art is somehow lightweight. Yeah. Um, and in my experience, art is the most difficult set of stuff I've ever had to confront. Mm -hmm. um, I have been asked to uh, study and write about things that were so difficult for me to understand, to grapple with that. Really what art taught me how to do was to think. Mm -hmm. When divisive language and divisive philosophies are sort of taking people apart, uh, I think the arts are something that has such power to bring people together. And arts that identify human condition and people share in that. They share in those experiences and say, I don't care who you are, that was beautiful. People seem to need to make art. It's not um, superfluous. It's not sort of the frosting on the cake. It seems to be a real human need. Um, it's probably driven by a couple things. And one, the need to connect to other people and the need to be creative. If you look at the richness of our arts community, it's very unique for a community, our size, the number of organizations that our community invest in is impressive. A community that prides itself on its arts, from the Gilmore Keyboard Festival, from the Kalamazoo Institute of Art, to our dance studios, to every medium that there is, we need to open it up even more and create that access for our students to be able to see it, for the rest of the world to know that it's here, and make it an attractor for our community. It's vitally important to us and to the community, and I am thankful that Kalamazoo supports the arts in, in, in the way that it does, and I'm very lucky to be here. I hope you find your purpose in this world and decide to start living it again. I hope our skeletons will get to dance with each other while you find the strength to pull yourself back together again. But most importantly, I hope we never end up like those broken walkie-talkies. 
to pieces of the same set, designed to communicate with each other, but still finding ways to break each other down and reasons why we can't hear anything but static when we try to connect. Too stubborn to realize that maybe they never needed fixing in the first place. Maybe all they needed was someone to take them from the back of the closet and give them a second chance. And maybe, just maybe, all they needed was a new set of batteries. Thank you. So, we, um, we had an opportunity this year to add another number to our duo. So, Speak It Forward is now a trio. And um, as we look forward, it also reminds us to look back into the past. That was 2015, and Kirk and Gabe were introducing Jessalyn as the newest addition to Speak It Forward, just as they used creativity to bring life to an organization born out of their own struggles, Jessalyn went on using her experiences to mentor the next generation of youth. We set out to define creativity. What we found is that it's hard to put it in a box, give it a single label, or even sum it up. Creativity embeds itself as a necessity in everything from education to innovation and the ways we live, work, and play. As humans, it liberates us. Most importantly, we learn that creativity and imagination are woven into the very fabric of Kalamazoo. Support for Kalamazoo Lively Arts is provided by the Irving S. Gilmore Foundation, helping to build and enrich the cultural life of greater Kalamazoo.